I'm really pleased uh, today to introduce our speaker, Ali Hortashu. Is that the pronunciation right. okay? Yeah. yeah. Ali comes to us from the University of Chicago, from the Department of Economics. Um, but he has uh, his education actually is something that's quite familiar to those of us in the iSchool. He has a undergraduate BS and MS in electrical engineering from Stanford, and then a PhD in economics. So we like that crossover type of person. He's been doing work um, on uh, auctions, on search, on a lot of things that are of interest to people here, on eBay, on internet pricing, um, and bidding, and reputations, and online dating, and uh, cyberspace auctions and pricing issues. So he's got a lot of interesting things to, to, to sh shed light on, things that we are interested in. I think he can shed an economist's um, view on. And I think I'm not going to take any more time of his time, but rather uh, turn it over to him to talk about matching and searching online. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anna. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here and uh, to, to, to talk to you about some of my research. And um, I set some of pretty <laughs> ambitious goals in terms of number of slides to cover, so we'll see how much we can talk about. I wanted to talk um, mainly about two papers that uh, Becky called distributed sort of. Uh, one is a work I've done recently with uh, Gunter Hitch and Dan Ariely on online dating. Um, and the other is some work I'm doing with Matthias Wildenbeest and uh, Barbara de los Santos at Indiana uh, on um, understanding how people search for products, in this case books, online. Um, so we'll see. I, I'm going to start with the first uh, project and uh, we'll see whether there will be time uh, uh, remaining to talk about the second project, the online dating. Uh, um, obviously, sort of, sort of, if you have any questions, sort of, uh, comments, you know, please feel to interrupt me, sort of, that's, you know, I'm actually very happy to have an interactive conversation here rather than just me talking uh, about this work. So what, what sort of, I think, uh, the common threads of the research that I would, I'm going to talk about today is, one is, you know, the positive aspects of it, or sort of as a social scientist, why am I personally interested in studying online environments? Well, sort of economics is, a, you know, basically a, a branch of social science that where we're trying to understand where, how people make decisions and how these decisions interact to uh, lead to market outcomes, prices, and how people sort of uh, get goods. But to write down our models through which we do our thinking, you know, we have to make a lot of assumptions as, how, as to how to make people make these decisions. Uh, what's beautiful about the online environments is that now we have a lot of information about what people actually do to inform us you know, when building these models. In particular, in these examples, you know, how do people find sort of uh, people to date, for example? That, that's sort of a question that has been analyzed by one of my colleagues, Gary Becker at Chicago, trying to build economic models of marriage, marriages and household formation. But you know, sort of we had very little information on how actually people you know, find uh, somebody to uh, uh, marry. So uh, in sociology as well, there's been a lot of sort of work on characterizing what kind of marriages are happening, but not too much on the process of getting there. So that's something that you know, I personally found very interesting as a social scientist uh, to study. The other is a more sort of meat and potatoes uh, uh, topic in economics, sort of how do people shop or search for products, right? So, you know, the, 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 the same book is being sold at many different online venues at many times drastically different prices. You know, why, for, first of all, do we see some dispersion in prices when it's the same goods being sold by everybody? But the second is sort of how, you know, is there something about people's search process for the lowest price or the book they want that leads to this type of uh, deviation from a single price for the good? that uh, we observe in the data. So again, so the internet, I think for the social scientist, provides troves of hard data to test theories on and to you know, basically build new theories uh, based on the hypotheses that have been uh, tested. Um, so in that sense, I am very uh, sort of, this, this is a very exciting area, not 
just for building technology, but for development of social science uh, as well. The normative aspect of the research is basically, I think, what, what are sort of economists and in general a lot of social scientists with a policy focus interested in, we're interested in sort of building more efficient platforms, more efficient markets, right? So, so for example, you know, from the perspective of consumer search, you know, how competitive is the market for books online? And you know, we know that Amazon is a really, you know, big behemoth out there with a big market share, but does this mean, you know, they have a lot of market power to sort of uh, charge uh, very high markups and lead to some sort of inefficiency in this marketplace? Or how to design sort of better matchmaking sites, how to sort of, you know, build recommendation engines that give, you know, lower people's time for searching to find a, uh, an ideal uh, mate. Uh, can we sort of use uh, some of the, uh, the models that we develop in economics or other social scientists to help with this uh, institution building process? Okay. So with that goal, so let me talk about the work on online dating. So in a nutshell, what we do here is, so we had the um, fortune to, to, have, uh, to collaborate with an online dating website, which I cannot name, unfortunately, because of the confidentiality uh, restrictions, uh, to work with their you know, anonymized uh, data on user actions. So, but we get very detailed actions, as you will see, on what people do on this site. We're going to use this information to first estimate, to, to get a sense of what people are looking for in a person to date. Okay, so essentially what we have is people facing dating profile. They see all the attributes in there and we get also a, a picture, right? So what of these attributes turn into click? So title of one of the papers that came up with this was what makes you click? So in a sense, that's what it is, sort of, you see the profile, you browse a bunch of profiles, and then you send emails to some of these people, from a subset of these people that you browsed. So we're going to use this information to get a sense of what different people, based on their declared attributes, seem to care about when they're uh, choosing who to email uh, for a date. Uh, and, and we're going to basically use this to build preference profiles for uh, every single user that we see in this uh, dating site, right? So in, in some ways, it's the, the precursor of a recommendation engine. What does this person like? Or what, does this per what do people who look like this person like? And use this to build a preference, uh, a user profile for each of these people, okay? So once we get these mate preferences, which I think are potentially interesting for uh, a number of social scientific purposes, what, what we then do is maybe a bit more of an extrapolation exercise. We, we then ask, we, we ask this question, how would you have, how would an economist have designed this website? Or at least sort of given these preferences, how would we have matched these people up? Okay. So I don't want to say sort of we were going to literally build a site like this to be the matchmaker of sort of internet as economists. But I, thought, I sort of want to see this as more of a, the precursor of a recommendation engine. And um, in the sense, you know, let's, if there are millions of people through which to search through and sort of some websites like match.com are reaching that, how do you sort of, you know, lower the cost of searching for people so that you know, sort of we help you sort of sort through all these options that are available to you in terms of, you know, doing your uh, the, your uh, communication. Okay? So that's sort of the site design or the institution design aspect of this work. But, the, but we also use the preference estimates in a more social, what I think, hope is a more social scientific purpose. So we want, so one, one question that a lot of sociologists, economists, anthropologists, psychologists have noticed is that people tend to marry people who are a lot like themselves. So this is called, you know, assortative mating or sort of endogamy. So, for example, if you look at the U.S. Census in terms of married couples, so, you know, there are very strong correlation patterns, obviously age, but education, for example, is very uh, highly correlated across couples as well. Along with this, sort of for smaller samples for which, of course, the census doesn't have the height, weight, and looks 
ratings of people, but for smaller samples that the people have uh, noticed these robust correlations across physical attributes as well. Okay. More strikingly, perhaps, uh, is the, are the endogamy patterns. So these, are, these numbers here are well, uh, what people call odds ratios. So basically, if there, people were matching randomly, how would, what would be the odds of... Um, so, for example, this black and black uh, may, uh, sorting pattern is basically, you know, African Americans are only a minority of the population, so if people are sorting randomly, then, um, th then an Af African American, sh only 10% of African Americans should be married with uh, other African Americans. But the ratio is more like one, so the, the, this odds ratio reflects there's, there are 10 times more likely than random sorting to marry within group than across groups. Okay, so there's very strong uh, within group uh, sorting across these ra racial groups. So one question people have said sort of, why do we see these endogamy patterns? Well, one is maybe people just like people who are like each other. Okay, that could be possible and that drives all these you know, sort of uh, within group correlations. But especially for, for example, inter interracial marriage, another hypothesis people have uh, put out is, well, maybe sort of people of different ethnicities never see each other, never interact with each other. That's why they, they go in their segregated circles, and that's why we have these very sort of within group uh, matches. The nice thing about the internet, of course, sort of in the site, there are no explicit segregation mechanisms. You can click on any uh, uh, profile. So, you know, we're going to look at how dates are formed there. But moreover, what we're going to do is we're going to use the Gale Shapley model, the, this, 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 this economist way of uh, making models, uh, making matches, to try to project what would ma uh, marriages look like in a world without any search or segregation frictions. Just based on preferences, how would people be matched? And just to you know, preview the result, we're going to basically find that preferences seem to be driving most of the observed endogamy. So you don't need to resort to something like segregation or search frictions to understand sort of these very stark within group uh, uh, preferences. It's just uh, within group uh, sorting patterns. Preferences alone can uh, explain um, a lot of this pattern as well. That would be the, yeah. So how do you know preferences? So, that, so, I'm gonna, so I guess we have to again make assumptions as to sort of you browse a profile, you, do you email that person or not? And we're going to assume sort of emailing a person is a vote towards somebody like that. And we're going to build up, aggregate those votes across profiles to build preference intensity or orderings across uh, profiles. Okay. Okay. So where does the data come from? Again, major unnamed matchmaking site. And uh, this was a company actually that I can say doesn't exist anymore. So it was uh, subsumed, uh, but uh, it, 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 it was, uh, so what we have is data from two metropolitan areas, uh, total of about 22,000 users, and we have the web logs, very detailed logs over three and a half months, and uh, we have all the profile data information that they've uh, provided, and the nice thing about this website is that there are very few empty cells because you had to sort of complete very detailed sort of answers before proceeding to the searching stage. So they get this information um, right at the beginning before you do this. Of course, we also have the photos. And uh, that's one thing a lot of, let's say, other data sets don't have, something about uh, physical attributes. You know, obviously, we're going to deal, we ha have to deal with this issue. Are these real photos or photos of somebody else? But taking what the photo as, as given, what we do is we ask basically a team of research assistants to go through all these photos and uh, rate them. And you know, I don't know whether University of Chicago undergrads <laughs> rankings <laughs> of uh, photos is very representative, but we try to get about 10 rankings for each photo in the data set. It was a pretty massive uh, evaluation uh, exercise. So we get uh, these uh, ratings on photo 
uh, from the team of uh, um, researchers. And the sample profile, I guess I probably shouldn't have to do this, but this is one of the co-authors sacrificing himself for the sake of science. Uh, and so it looks something like this. Again, sort of I can't reveal which website it is. This, is, this was on match.com, but uh, it looks something like this. What is the information that we observe? Here's where we have very detailed data. Basically, we, s we can track users upon login. So Jason logs in and browses a profile and chooses to email that person. But then we also see the sort of set of responses. A so the person, April, reads the email by Jason and sends a reply. And then this goes on for a while. And then Jason sends an email to April with the keyword, let's meet and a phone number. Yeah? So you had access to the content and so they... I did not, so they had access to the content. Yeah. So, so the fact that they could use that for privacy was not an issue. Th that's right, so <laughs> correct. So, <clears throat> so they coded this thing about, yeah, e e e e email and phone, phone number. And the only thing we observe is, you know, for a select set of keywords, whether there was uh, an exchange of uh, emails with, uh, with let's meet or coffee or phone number uh, that may have, that may be a proxy for the arrangement of a physical date. So that, that's our outcome measure, if you will. For all this communication, we see whether these people sort of may have, you know, exchanged phone numbers to set up uh, an actual date. So now sort of how are we going to use this information? As I said, sort of we're going to use this information about browsing a subset of users and then a further subset we send an email to. This first stage of the process, we're going to say, you know, look, uh, we're going to try to model this as well. You know, all these people I brought, uh, emailed, I prefer to people I, I did not email among the set subset of people I browsed. Of course, there's the issue of there are people not browsing the entire subset of people but our estimation, our uh, inference procedure, that says basically ranks only within a subset of alternatives. So, and we're trying to get at ordinal rankings of people. Um, so, in that sense, you know, we're not uh, compromised by the fact that you only look at the subset. But uh, another big, big, big concern is, you know, whether, you know, these declared attributes can be used as you know actual attributes of people so so one one response to this might be well you know sort of when we're trying to read people's preferences we're just looking at you know the stimulus that they had and we want to see how people respond to this declaration versus another declaration in that sense you know as analysts we have we see the same information that these users had access to themselves but i think it is important to look at um whether there might be consistent deviations in some of these declarations. So what we did is we compared the declared variables, age, education, income, ethnicity, height and weight, etc., with um, survey data from the current population survey or the anthrop anthropometric tables. So by and large, sort of what we have is the site users are compared to the general population, as you might expect, are younger, somewhat more educated, somewhat higher income, with underrepresentation of minorities. We also find basically sort of, you know, guys online sort of a bit taller than the guys in the general population, even controlling for the attributes, and sort of uh, also, so, you know, some weight declarations might be a bit uh, lower, even if you can control for, you know, being single. So, you know, there might be some a misrepresentation of these facts, and there were also sort of a lot of people who were making above the $250,000 line, especially from men, uh, compared to what it is in the, you know, CPS. So there might be some amount of misrepresentation, but as, you know, the, it is difficult for us to actually audit this one by one to say, okay, is this real or not? What we're going to say is, you know, here's, a, you know, like the user, we see this pro profile A versus profile B, assuming that the level of misrepresentation is not different across these two profiles, how does this person rank 
profile A versus uh, profile B. Okay? So, I, so I would say in here, the, the, the relevant concern might be if profile A sends warning signs to you know, the user and say, okay, this cannot be true, hence I'm going to discount some of the attributes here and take the person who looks less impressive but more true. So th this might be an important, it might be a source of bias in our preference estimates uh, if this were the case. But what this would do, I think, is would penalize, let's say, response to sort of people who say they make a lot of money or you know, very high education or they look very good. So our preference estimates would say people don't care about these attributes as much as they actually do. I think that would be the sort, uh, sort of bias that you would observe. So again, estimated made preferences, we're going to say, look, every person has some outside option. Write the emails, even though you can copy and paste, uh, is somewhat costly. So you know, given your outside options and some bit of a cost of emailing, you're not going to email everybody that you browse. You're going to sort of ch choose people. And um, what we're going to assume is that uh, you, the people that you br uh, email gives you higher utility than people you don't email. Okay. So now, you know, the, we also in the paper, if you sort of, we have a pretty extensive section about this sort of, there might be other biases in this preference estimation uh, uh, process if people are strategizing. So let me be very open about so suppose you see somebody that you, looks very very attractive to you but you're like there's no way you know this person is going to reply back to me so why waste the time and effort to do this so there this could bias our some of our estimates as well in the sense right so we're going to again sort of uh, our estimates will tell us that those people who look very attractive do not look as attractive as they really are so, but what we sort of checked in the data is basically, you know, if you look at uh, people's behavior in terms of who to email, so, uh, people who seem, okay, so, so we did this in terms of looks ratings. So we looked at, uh, let's say, men who are in the lowest deciles in terms of attractiveness and looked at who they emailed among women versus men who are in the highest decile of attractiveness. So if we think men in the lowest decile are strategizing, well, these very attractive you know, people are not going to uh, re respond back to me, then you might see more of sh the strategic shading by these people. They do not approach these people as frequently as people who are more attractive. But we don't see any of these differences in the data. So people who are not very attractive really do go for you know, people sort of who are, seem very attractive in the dimensions. And we, uh, we, we, we think this is because the cost of endings, uh, sending emails is probably pretty small. And the cost of rejection, especially in this environment, is pretty small compared to something like um, a traditional dating environment. Yeah. Yeah, so, so actually, they're, in that respect, they're pretty similar. Um, it, it is true men are more sort of, on average, much more, let's say, they make the first proposal, women tend to wait more, but actually it's not that, you know, it's basically about 60 or 70 percent of first proposals come from men, 30 percent come from, there's a lot of women-initiated uh, responses as well. The work I'm aware of, like, it's, it proposes that women kind of underestimate I see. So they, they might be more strategic, okay. So here sort of we didn't, you know, it could be a statistical significance issue, sort of, you know, within statistical significance, we couldn't reject, you know, less attractive versus more attractive women uh, differ different, uh, act differently. But, uh, the other question is, you know, in, in some of these sites, it actually costs money to send this Correct. Yeah. Here there wasn't, so it, if, it, definitely. If there was money, it costs money, then it would have been very different, this, yeah. this, uh, this, this is, uh, so, so on our preference models, I mean, one could write down a lot of different specifications. You know, this is by all, not by all means the best specification, but 
what we want to focus on is what I want to highlight is so, okay so let me try to unpack uh, this notation for you so this is the utility that a man m with profile uh, with attributes x sub m gets from a woman with profiles x w uh, and that are the parameters the loadings that this person att uh, attaches to these things so 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 first of all what we have is this preference depending what we call what, what, would, what we call vertically on the mate's preferences i.e. let's say a person with higher attractiveness if beta is positive is going to get a higher utility score and this, this uh, index will be shared among all men regardless of what their characteristics are so there's no xm here there's the, 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 this, this man's characteristics do not enter into this part of the utility specification but the other terms, in the other terms of the specification, we allow for interactions between the man and the woman's attributes, i.e. So some sort of distance between you know, your education, your income, your, 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 uh, your racial background. This, this can also have, uh, shape uh, your, your ranking uh, or the utility that you get from this person. Okay, so, Again, so you could saturate the model a lot more with more and more um, attributes coming in. This was one of the simplest, more parsimonious specifications that could come that both reflected that there might be what we call, again, vertical aspects of a person, i.e., you know, there are attributes on which a lot of us would agree in terms of its attractiveness to us, but there are also idiosyncratic aspects like our match in terms of you know, education background or sort of, you know, ethnic background, religious background, political leanings, etc., that are not vertical. These are horizontal aspects of uh, preferences. Okay? And so, so what we do again is basically we re regard the data as, you know, you having browsed this person, if you email or not, you know, we have an indicator for you email this person and we build up a likelihood. Um, this is like a simple uh, logit type specification for those of you who work with those models. So it, it, we, we estimate this logit model to build, build up these, uh, to estimate these parameters, beta, gamma, and uh, theta. And, 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 and let me say sort of where does this lead to? So the nice thing about this is given any observed attributes xm and xw, I can tell you your, a person's ranking over all, uh, uh, a per, so uh, M's rankings over uh, double, all women who have this set of attributes. So this, this, this basically for each user I can build the ordering of preferences over all other site users. So this, 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 this estimation allows me to do uh, that. So again, so what is this doing? In effect, it is basically looking at, you know, who the people like me are choosing. It's very similar in spirit to what, say, the simple recommender system uh, would do. What do people who look like me choose? You know, it, it is very similar in spirit to that. And what are the results? I mean, so I'm going to talk a little bit about them, but I should say, so a lot of these are not that striking. You know, we know very well from introspection or uh, social scientific work what these might be. Uh, but um, one thing we want to, I want to s s emphasize is s s some of the aspects of our sort of uh, preference estimation exercise I think might have better external validity than survey-based uh, uh, attempts to do this. For example, race preferences. I think it is hard to extract people's attitudes towards you know, interracial dating through surveys asking, you know, would you go out with a person of a different race versus looking at what they actually do online. I think sort of what we sort of offer here is, you know, a revealed preference measure rather than a stated preference, yeah. Exactly, yeah. Uh, so, so uh, race, uh, po political leanings. So, we have a lot of discrete variables. All of these are lumped 
in, in there. So, uh, while you divorce or not, so do you have divorce with children? Exactly. So I have basically, you know, I think our preference estimates are about three pages long. I have a <laughs> long set of coefficients that are all those, uh, basically the parameters on all, all those interaction terms. And you're, you're using those side by side with what looks to be continuous variables with the X's? Exactly, yeah. Or there's like income or something? Exactly, like yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, we could also, you know, discretize that and do it as, you know, interactions like this, but. For now, what we did is we just look at, for example, education. Is there a different preference for somebody who's more educated than you versus less educated than you? You know, so we put that in, in more asymmetrically. Yeah. So you want us to focus more on sort of what the parameters, what people's preferences are, or really more the matching algorithm later when you're going to sort of see. That. So I, I was going to, I was hoping to, to go through a few slides to show you what something comes out in preferences, but then I'm going to plug them into the matching algorithm. Some, you're going to see some results. But again, the full set of results is basically this uh, table of coefficients. And actually, you know, Gunter and I, we were thinking of starting a website that would be like, find your sort of, <laughs> give me your attributes, I'll tell you who your stable match might be. You know, that's powered by these estimates. But we never sort of, <laughs> you know, our web programming skills are not. <laughs> It could be, that's right, exactly. <laughs> yeah, we don't want people to <laughs> come sue us after. But so, yeah, if, if you look at the paper, the paper has the, you know, is an appendix, this long table of, you know, hard to interpret coefficients. Let me try to show you some graphs that sort of try to parse through some of these r results. Yeah, sure. So I guess I, I must admit I haven't I didn't do a exo you know exhaustive survey of the ethnographic literature, but sort of if some of that informs my priors about going in in that sense, you know there weren't too many other too many surprises. So uh, I think what we can offer is more quantitatively. So because a lot of these are we know I think let's say the human mind or the tradition let's say is easy you know uh, saying oh do you like this or not so. Do you want more education or less education? But it's hard for people to report. Keeping everything constant, would you like this versus uh, this other attribute? So this is what we're able to do. And, and what we're also able to do is, by putting things into this more um, uh, mathematical, this, this uh, preference framework, we can look at trade-offs. For example, how much income would you forego or how much more income would you have to make to compensate for an attribute that is you know, discounted by the market, let's say. So I'm going to show you a little bit of some of these trade-off measures that we come up with. But I think by and large, qualitatively, our results are very similar to what I think ethnographers or you know, survey-based uh, results have come up with. That's, I think, sort of, I'm going to say yes, but with, a, I think, a great deal of trepidation there, because sort of I, th I do think sort of online interactions may change attitudes. You know, there's a treatment effect of this. The reason I, I'm saying yes here is that this was pretty early on, the 2003 data. So in the sense, you know, this, this has been much more prevalent in the last decade, uh, so that in that sense, People who have been in this, you know, online dating may, may have had a lot more exposure to certain things. So, but I, I would say that's a fantastic question that I wish I knew more about, and I'm I'm very open to studying, you know, how online exposure changes preferences. Yeah. So there is there so that definitely in, in the sense, right? So these people have self-selected into this dating site. You know, we're gonna estimate their preferences, but if they're very, you know, selected, they might not be representative of preferences out 
you know, that might be covered by surveys or ethnographic. So in, this, so in that sense, I think it is a bit sort of reassuring that we're finding very similar patterns as the other studies that might not be s subject to the uh, sa sample selection issues. <clears throat> okay, so, so what are some results? And I'm going to show you the results. Again, as I sort of uh, said earlier in response to Kyle's question, our results you know, come out in this very long table of coefficients. It's hard to sort of parse them through and sort of uh, represent them graphically. Let me tell you sort of a slightly different model we estimated, which is a simpler one to estimate. And this is basically just regressing the number of emails you get on your characteristics. Okay, so now let's think, think through what that might be. Right? Basically, when does that exercise, just looking at a regression uh, you know, of how many emails you get on your characteristics, how can that, in what environment does that reveal preferences? Well, I'm going to posit that if this is a world where people are, have a ranking on, in their, on their foreheads, and that ranking doesn't change for anybody, so it's, it's in that world that, that this would be a measure of preference, right? The, the, what I'm trying to get is the, the people with a higher ranking are going to get more emails, and I want to understand you know, what aspects of preferences uh, drive, uh, uh, what, aspect, what attributes are driving the more emails you get. Okay? So bear one second. So, uh, so this is about looks. So in this world where you just regress emails on uh, your looks rating, as coded by our undergrads, you, know, you get not very surprisingly that people who are you know, sort of uh, more attractive are getting more emails. And the way to read this is compared to the base case, person in the median uh, of the looks distribution, a, per, a man in the top fifth percentile of the looks distribution is going to get three times as many emails uh, controlling for other attributes. Okay. So it's interesting that somehow in men there is a very unequal distribution. There are sort of, we call it, this is, we call this the Brad Pitt result. There are some very sort of attractive males out there. For women, there's a very strong monotonic and very statistically significant. These pink bars are reflecting statistical significance uh, relationship as well, but it's not as unequal as for men. We also look at sort of how much of the variation in email that somebody uh, receives is explained just by the photo rating alone. And, you know, not very surprising, it's a lot. So for guys, you know, about 30%, a third of the variation in emails you get as explained by just your photo. And for women, it's about 44%. Uh, so sorry, 31, so sorry, 31% 30, 30, for women and 20% for men. And, um, and it's, it's also sort of the, the first bullet point, I apologize, sort of I uh, mixed these up. I want to say is there's a lot of unknowns out there. So even though we put in 300 attributes out there, we can only explain about a third to about a, you know, 44% of the total variation in email. So, yes? I would agree. So I think the interpretation of the standard regression from the perspective of does this reveal something of preferences, that's where the economics gets in. We're not there yet, right? So, correct. So I guess, you know, did this, once I estimate this and I build the profiles, then it's going to become economics. All right? So because this is a utility function, this is a preference ordering that I'm estimating. Yes, yeah, yeah, yep. But that doesn't correspond to the second part where you say looks only account for 19% of the, the, the variance in men as opposed to 31%. Uh, that is correct. It's, it's from sort of if you just run the regression with looks alone, you know, that's the R squared you get. That's what I'm. But, but this, this graph, it doesn't come from looks alone. It's just, you know, with all the covariates in. The other ones were looks alone. Exactly, yeah. So what about, you know, I can, you know, speed through this to get to the eco e economics of it. But uh, in terms of the income, for example, you know, for men, so if women's uh, response to men's declared income, there's a pretty strong uh, monotonic response. But for men's response to women's income, we see you know, very little um, 
in terms of statistical and economic significance response, especially on the higher categories, but you know, the estimates are quite noisy there. How about education? So what we find is that you know, women do tend to like sort of more educated men, sort of you know, college educated men are better sort of higher rated than high school uh, graduate men. You know, I guess being, you know, although sort of having higher degrees, we can't find statistically significant the different results. But from the perspective of men, we basically see almost no response sort of, you know, being, I sort of joke about this to my students, being in the master's or PhD program might not be so good. <laughs> but I don't know, sort of, it depends on what kind of emails you're, you're attracting to. But, uh, so this doesn't take, okay. Okay, so occupation premia, lawyers, and sort of doctors, but you know, our result is you know, sort of you know, military sort of, you know, I don't know for what, whatever reason, get more emails. Yeah. Yeah. Oh no, so I, this is, uh, there's strong dependence on income. So this is, uh, women like men who make income, so for, yeah, so this is, yeah. Okay. So let me, let me just, uh, again, to get, so, so one, one is, is there heterogeneity? So one thing we looked at is, you know, are people's responses to attractiveness dif different across people with different education background? This graph wants to say that they're not very different sort of, you know, uh, men with high school education are not very different in their response to attractiveness compared to men who are in graduate school and similar for women. How about education? This is where we find, I think, some interesting uh, uh, divergence across groups where we basically find sort of people tend to favor you know, people who, are, who have the same educational background. Okay, so high school uh, educated women tend to, you know, discount higher educated men. You know, same with high school educated men. They don't like women who are more educated than themselves. And we see a different bias for graduate school educated women who have, uh, who like more educated men, uh, or people who have a similar degree of education, with, you know, men of, who are higher educated not showing much of a response towards uh, women's education at all. Uh, Excuse me? Uh, so yeah, the race was controlled as a factor, in, yeah, in this. Uh, across races as well? I, I would sort of, yeah. Generation? That, that, uh, so this controls for age, but again, so we didn't interact with age, so we don't see for differentially for ages. Uh, in this, yeah. I, I agree. I mean, sort of, in some ways, sort of, I want to say this, at least in terms of report attributes, is the more representative. There's, you know, it's like the match.com, so you see people who look a lot more like the census than JDate would. But uh, I, I mean, I agree that very different, you can get different insights from uh, other sites. So I, I don't want to sort of belabor this too much, but so one thing, as I said, we, we do something about trade-offs. Uh, and here's something we can do. Again, now if we put our economics hat on our he uh, heads and say, look, we estimated what, what I'd like to call the stable preference profiles. So, and these, each ranking, you know, depends on basically this index of attributes, and these attributes should be substitutable with each other. In the sense, you know, I, I see a loading on income and height. So, how much more money should a guy, you know, sort of who's, you know, five feet tall make to, to be the same level of attractiveness as, you know, somebody who's, you know, five, ten, between, you know, five, ten and six inches tall. Well, according to this, he has to make $300,000 more. Okay. And 
So for women, so we don't have too much data here, so our you know, estimates are very noisy, so we can't do this uh, trade-off uh, uh, very well. So, but, but maybe more sort of uh, evocatively, so what are the sort of race trade-offs? So, yes. Uh, so, so we do put in some interaction effects, so, and, and of course, doing the trade-off, then we have to sort of make all those sorts of assumptions as to which person for whom are we making this trade-off. So we're taking basically the average person, you know, in this. But of course, across the populations, you know, these interaction effects are going to affect the trade-offs quite a bit. So if you do the same for, you know, race uh, premia, so, f for example, so if, you know, I, you know, so I'm, I'm an Asian guy. If I want to be at the same level of attractiveness to Caucasian women as a, a Caucasian man is, I have to make two hundred forty thousand dollars more, uh, according to this. Again, so so the reason we have a lot of not feasibles here for the women's trade-offs is that basically in the data we just don't see much sensitivity by men to income. So that's not a substituting factor that we find. Uh, there, so that's why sort of our, you know, this exercise becomes somewhat meaningless if the data is saying no response to income uh, at all, you know, across race versus income. Okay, so so now sort of let's use more of these preferences. So again, what I have, you know, in theory, as I said, I could um, build a website saying, you know, okay, sort of. You know, give me a profile now. How do you have to play around with your profile to make yourself as attractive as, you know, somebody with the desired set of attributes? Uh, I could do something like this, but let's now go into the um, more the, the the match formation stage. So, so now the, the the economic question is the following. So suppose now you have a set of you know men and women with preference rankings over the other side of the market, how are we going to match them? Okay. Do we give everybody their first preference? Well, the problem with that is, you know, if I match with the first preference, you know, I might not be her, her first preference. So, so, so a lot of recommendation engines in the product space are about, you know, what are you going to like the most? Netflix wants to recommend me the movie that I'm going to like the most. But here, Recommending me the movie, the person I'm going to like the most is not going to necessarily be a good idea because that person is not going to necessarily like me the best. So how do we come up with a matching system that has a desirable prop property? And uh, the, so what Gale and Shapley thought about in, back in 1962, and I believe David Gale was here at Berkeley until he passed away a few years ago, um, was to come up with an algorithm that that has a desirable property in terms of matching. So we have a set of you know, men and women. We have preference orderings. So what is what is the objective? The objective is to match people so that the match pairs won't have any find any opportunities to elope with each other. So what does this mean again? So suppose you know, the, the black box tells me who my match is. Then I look around, I see all these people who I prefer more to my proposed match. So I can go behind the back of the black box and try to call these people and say, okay, I like you better than my match. Would you like to match with me? What Gail Shapley wants to guarantee is that none of these people I call will be willing to call me back because they will like their proposed match more than me. Okay, and this will be called a stable match. Okay. So now the question is, you know, the mathematical question is, for any given set of preference orderings, does there exist a stable match? And we can we find it? Is there an algorithm that reaches that that can you know is there an algorithm to reside in this black box that pr proposes stable match? And what they showed is actually, yes, there always exists a stable match. 
And a simple algorithm um, that they propose uh, achieves it. And here's how the algorithm works. And I actually think it has you know, a lot of parallels with how dating works in the real world. So imagine a bar. Right? So let's say men are sitting on the stools, and the women come in, and they're deciding you know, who to sort of strike a conversation with. And initially, they first go to the person, they make proposals, let's say, to the person that they're most interested in, the highest on their preference list. So you know, as the person sees the people who are interested in, in him, he chooses the person that he's most interested with. So now some people will be rejected, and they will go to their second most preferred alternative, and try to strike a conversation there. So now it is possible that because of this rejection, somebody will come in this next round that you prefer more to the person you were having a conversation with. So you're going to break off that conversation and start a conversation with this new person. And this will go on until nobody's rejected anymore. And, you know, and, and, uh, and basically we're going to say, look, you know, these are the conversations that are stable and we're going to uh, stop the process. So just, you know, in algorithmic language, right, so step one, each W proposes to her most preferred M, who has not already rejected her. And then the step two, this man is engaged to his most preferred proposer and rejects all other proposers. And then those who are rejected go back to their list and go to their second person, second highest person on the list. And this goes on and on. And at the end, what happens? That each, let's say, W is going down her preference list and each M is going up her preference list. And at some point, this algorithm stops. Okay? And the proof is very easy. Why is this a stable match? Suppose you know, we have a pair who would have preferred each other rather than the stable matches? Could this exist? Well, it cannot because this W prime, this of this pair M prime and W prime, W prime must have proposed to M prime before proposing to her assigned partner. But why did she end up with somebody worse than M prime? It's because M prime rejected her at that round. So, which means that you know this pair do not like each other more than their proposed matches. So it's a proof by contradiction that Gale and Shapley came up with. Okay. So, so aside, so, so now, okay. The issue is, does anyone use this algorithm? So as I hinted to, I think some of the real world dating dynamics, let's say, does resemble this. You know, people do make proposals, get rejected, you know, go to go on to somebody else. We don't like to think we're going down our preference list. Maybe we're coming across, you know, new people. Sort of, you know, that in that way the world is different than this too. It's not a static thing. So we have different opportunities. Um, but nobody literally uses Gale Shap before this. But uh, <clears throat> although it is used in settings like the medical school, uh, when you know, medical residents graduate there to to match with hospitals, this is the black box that they implement to match the interns with the hospitals. But what I would like to say is, you know, given preference profiles, you know, this is the, in some ways one of the best, the, the, the only theoretical benchmark that economists have come up with to say this is a good match. And in many ways this is a somewhat different than efficiency, but it's at least stable. At least you know, when we propose this match, there are no sort of ways of sort of doing things better than this proposal. People cannot go around the black box and unravel the results of this black box to make things better for themselves. So in that sense, yes? I'm wondering if it might be because that the marriage problem is different from the residency problem in that uh, there is no uh, deadline, there's no synchronization. So it's more of an online, uh, it's more, so I'm thinking about whether you look at the marriage problem or the secondary problem, and um, there's a set of algorithms associated for those where you basically have a continuous streaming of candidates. Yep, yep. And then it becomes a question of yep. uh, 
what's the optimum stopping rule? Yep, yep. So my question is whether we can apply the data for daily summits yep. to that other algorithm. Yeah. So actually, sort of, there's a, we cite in the paper, there's a wonderful paper by a guy named Hiroyuki Adachi that sort of uh, characterizes this as a searching market where you sort of, you, you just sample people from the pool of you know, potential partners and you decide whether to stop with that person or not. And it shows that as sort of the frequency with which you meet people goes, becomes faster and faster, the stationary sort of matching is going to look a lot like the gale shapley stable matching. It shows a, is an asymptotic result that achieves this. So what we can think of the real world is sort of, you know, somewhere away from that asymptotic limit where, you know, sort of, sure, you know, there are costs of searching over people and we don't sort of encounter all these people. Um, but I think it's, it's, you know, I think you're exactly to spot on in terms of this uh, stopping rules being applied uh, in this. Um, yeah. I see. So, so, I mean, you may not want to match because it's just it's, uh, below some cut. Is there a thing to point to that? Uh, in, in, in Gail Shapley or so in the. Yeah, yeah so, yeah, exactly. So, in Gail Shapley, they do allow for not marrying as an option. So, you could rank not being married, not being matched above being matched with, you know, with other people in the list. And that could yield you remaining single as a stable outcome. It's exactly. So in the recommendation system, so what we do, I think sort of, there are different ways of doing One is, as you say, have a one-to-many or many-to-many -many type matching algorithm. And there are sort of, you know, theorems about whether s stable matches exist. You know, if you have in each, say, man or woman is a capacity of 20 dates or something, sort of, does it exist a stable profile for that? What I might start with, you know, sort of, is if I were to build a recommendation engine is, so one issue that we have in, you know, so, okay, Here, here's how it might work. So, I see your profile, I, I see your attributes, and based on what other people look like, what other people chose who, who had the same attributes, I can assign your preference profile. And then I can run Gail Shapley, assuming that's your preference profile. But as I said before, the attributes that I observe in the data explain only 40% of people's preferences. There's all sorts of noise out there. So what I would do, I would sort of basically add a noise term there, do many simulations, and look at these many alternate worlds where, you, you know, who your stable match would be with this noise term added in. And I would compile that list of people and give it to you as a potential. Uh, better than just sort of ranking people, just showing a rank list? I mean, it seems like a lot more work. Uh, so in terms of, so you might rank this. It's true, I mean, that's, you know, you would know the interface is much better. So I guess it might depend on the uh, number of people to rank through. I think sort of if you are, let's say, here's the problem. If there are, I think, 100,000 people on the other side and you are one of the middling people, if you're going to start from, you know, number one, going, you know, and if your stable match is the reside. It is true. It is a lot of computation. It's, you know, so, um, so I guess what I would like to say is, if, if we're one of these people whose match is right in the middle of some rank list, it might be hard for you to exactly find that by just you know going down your preference list. Here, that co extra computation might be. But again, so <laughs> I, I haven't thought through too much about the actual implementation of this, but. Uh,
Yes, that's interesting. I mean, so I haven't, again, I haven't thought through the computation. It might be that what John was suggesting, you know, finding these cutoff points and sort of, that might be an easier way to characterize what the equilibrium set is, but uh, I mean, we should definitely talk about this. <laughs> if uh, You know, I think, as I said, so I think, I don't know, I'm, I'm just thinking about potential, you know, like for example, I know the government of Singapore runs an online, you know, dating system for, this, let's say it's university college educated residents, and they have professional matchmakers <laughs> that. Uh, so, so one thing I want to say is, you know, so, so now, so what we did is basically we took the Gale Shapley algorithm off the shelf, and you know, we just used, get, got our preference rankings and we just let it run, and to see what happens. So, so one thing that really surprised us, you know, we weren't expecting this at all, is uh, when you look at the characteristic of who is matched by Gail Shapley versus who actually went on a date with somebody, a lot of these you know, macro characteristics look very similar. So in terms of, you know, so what we did is basically looked at these sorting statistics that a lot of uh, sociologists and economists look at. How do people sort in age, income, education, height, weight, looks, etc. I mean, you know, those are not, they're not perfect fits, and they, we didn't design the preference estimate based on a fit criterion. We just ran the algorithm through. They look pretty similar. And that's where I think, and, and what's a keyword match again? That's basically whether these two people send email, both send emails containing coffee or a phone number. So whether they arrange physical dates. So there are the many, to, uh, many aspect does coming through, people have, you know, five different phone sort of exchange, so we, we average across people. So I interpret this as saying, you know, this was, you know, people just going through rank lists or just going through lists of people and going down preference lists approximates pretty well the, the centralized algorithm of Gale Shapley. So people in this decentralized world are achieving what the centralized, let's say, social planner could have done, at least in terms of the macro characteristics. Okay, so, so in that sense, sort of, you know, as an economist, you know, okay, well, the invisible hand of the market, right, so, versus the visible hand of the social planner. So that's like the average of all the people that send you an email. Exactly, the yeah. One by the exactly, yeah. And it's, but again, so I want, I don't want to oversell this result to say, you know, it's exactly the same. So these are macro characteristics, sorting on those. If you just look at individual um, who you match with, there are a lot of differences. But uh, the average difference we report in the paper is, so on each side of the market, there's about, let's say, uh, 3,000 people. So among the 3,000 people, uh, I think the, the Gail Shapley, on average, puts people to your top 150th person. So in, in that sense, it's not too bad. You're, you're, you're actually matched in a stable match, not too far away from your highest ranked person. So, so I, I actually view that as not being, you know, it's somewhat <laughs> uplifting. You know, at the end, you know, because of all these feasibility constraints, we're not too far away from our first choice. And um, and then the dates also sort of are pretty much around there. Sort of, you know, people sent, you know, if you believe the preference orderings, you know. According to that, you're not too far away from your first choice. So in that sense, you know, they're still pretty similar. Which, by the way, while I'm at that point, let me just sort of muse a little bit as to why we might get that result. So how is it possible that people are matched with, you know, even, because, uh, even in the presence of all these conflicting preferences, how are you able to be matched with people who are close to your first choice? Well. One way this can arise is if people have very heterogeneous preferences, or people like people who are like each other. So if people are very, let's say, segmented in terms of their preferences, people just go towards like, toward, then it is possible that you know the only person, I, the person people I will rank the most are the people who are going to like me the most. That's a world in which you're going to be pretty close to your first choice, but a world in which you know. There is, you know, people, let's say men only care about attractiveness, women, and let's say both sides only care about attractiveness. 
that's a world where a lot of people got very far away from their first choice. Because, you know, the rank number 10, you know, tens will be matched with tens, nines will be matched with nines, down to ones matching with ones. All the ones will be very, very far away from their um, most preferred match. So that result sort of suggests heterogeneity in preferences. So, <coughs> so that, I think, um, aspect sort of, I didn't put it in the slides, but something that came out of this uh, result. So let me go to the final phase of this project, which was, you know, even do a bigger sort of extrapolation. We say, okay, look, this is online dating, of course. These are preference for dating. We know these are not necessarily mar preference for marriage because who knows what these, you know, people want to do, get out of the site. But, you know, we have this very rich set of preference profiles for very, you know, pretty broad slice of society. Let's see if, you know, so, so what, what do we do? We, we basically reweight the dat dating uh, sample to resemble the census in terms of demographic characteristics, right? So there were too few minorities, so let's blow up the set of minorities in the sample. You know, sort of these are too educated or too high, too high income people. Let's sort of reduce those numbers and uh, upweight the people who have lower education and lower income. And then let's run Gail Shapley with this population of daters who resemble the census and see whether the matching outcomes from this resemble anything like the marriages we see in the census. Okay. So what can this illuminate? Again, sort of, I think sort of one thing we want to hit is you know, the fact that you know, these the strong homogamy or endogamy patterns. People, you know, are uh, sorted out along age, race, religion, education, income, physical attributes. And why is this? Well, it could be because of preferences. People like people who look like themselves. Or it could be sort of constraints on the search process. You know, people marry people who are within close uh, proximity. People meet in school, work, you know, church, social clubs that, you know, similar people go along with. So it could be these search frictions that drive this. So what we would like to think is, you know, our exercise is creating basically the frictionless world where there are only preferences. And a social planner, according to Gail Shapley, is assigning matches. And this is the, basically the world where the only constraints, if you will, are the preferences of other people. I, to, you know, I haven't read this book, but my wife tells me, Jean -Paul, Sartre said something about hell as other people. <laughs> But uh, in this sense, it is true that other people's preferences are constraining who you can match with in this world. So <laughs> that's, that's the main constraint. Um, so so does, does this type of patterns uh, arise from this, even if there are no search frictions? And, uh, and let me just display the results. Um, the main result is, is when we reweight the sample and do the Gale Shapley, we get pretty close. I think we get more correlate, for example, age correlations, education, you know, sort of, some of these correlations, you know, are, are pretty well, well in line. One thing we don't get too much is this income correlation. Although there is a, you know, there's a big issue there in the sense for mar married couples, right, so a lot of, Traditional households, you know, one person doesn't work, so it is hard to sort of impute income to that person. So in terms of coming up with a good income correlation is very uh, difficult. We tried a little bit, but it actually didn't, you know, nudge up the income correlation too much. I guess what I want to say is, you know, what this reveals, again, you know, subject to all the caveats that went into building preferences, is that, you know, it is possible that Preferences alone might be dri driving a lot of the segmentation or sort of sorting patterns that we see in the data. We don't need to resort to segment, segment, uh, segregation or other search frictions as a quantitative force to drive these things. Of course, these ex exist. But I, what I would like to say is 
maybe to the first order, preferences might be the bigger driving force than explicit segregation. That said, and again, I want to say this with you know, quite a bit of trepidation, this notion of preferences, I personally think, is you know, a very loaded type word. So as economists, we take it as given. We say, OK, people have stable preferences. You know, and we're rational according to our preferences, but we almost never question where the preferences come from. And I do think sort of um, this is an environment where, I'm sorry, I forget to ask, but somebody asked, like, do we think this is representative? Uh, I, I do think uh, this is an environment where people interact with other people and learn a lot of, about a lot of people, and their, their so-called preferences can evolve quite a bit over time. And you know, unfortunately, I cannot say too much <laughs> about this in this, except sort of to say, look, you know, I think this is a giant research question that needs to be answered. Sort of, let's have sort of good sort of research designs where we actually can document whether you know more interaction leads to sort of you know change in preferences and attitudes towards marriage and you know, other kind of social interaction, and you know, see sort of. There's an evolution of this, you know. Fortunately, sort of, I haven't found uh, another dating website that's willing to give you data so far. But, you know, it's 2013 now. I wonder what the preferences look like now compared to 2003. I think it might be very different, and some of these patterns might, be, you know, some of these so-called boundaries might have been very much um, crossed uh, at this point. So. <clears throat> I can sort of, um, I was planning to say a bit more about some other research on uh, search. Uh, I can entertain questions now if you would like, or I can barrage you with <laughs> another set of slides. So, should, I, I can tell you a little bit, a few things about search. So, I, let me change gears a bit and I should go to another set of slides we have. So this is um, some of the, another line of research that I've been interested in. So, um, and that actually ties a lot to, you know, as I was telling Marty uh, earlier today, um, the, the first paper I know of that has the economics of information, or, you know, and, and its title is George, by George Stigler. And George Stigler sort of wrote the paper where basically, you know, we know most consumers do not know the prices of, let's say, they're going to buy a tire. What are the prices uh, that different retailers are charging? They're going to go through some cost search process to find out, you know, different prices and then choose, among, choose the one that's best for themselves. And then Hal has a beautiful paper that describes sort of what might happen to prices if people show the search, uh, if people have search costs. So he, he had this world, he basically wanted to explain why do we see sales at supermarkets? And these tend to be sort of rather unpredictable. And his answer was the following. So suppose there are two different kinds of consumers. One are called shoppers in his model. And they're like my mother-in-law, you know, who's retired and she thinks, you know, buying things cheap is the way to make money. So, you know, she knows the prices of milk in every single grocery store in the sort of the radius that, you know, she travels in. Versus myself, you know, and my wife sort of, we have a four-year-old, so we don't have time to search around. So we just go to the grocery store and grab the milk at whatever price it is. Um, so what Shal showed is that basically to discriminate between these two types of people, Firms have the, can have the strategy of randomizing prices, sometimes setting a low price, which attracts all the shoppers like my mother-in-law, but a lot of times charge prices that are you know, high, which is going to attract people like me who happen to just go to the store and pick up the milk. And on average, they're going to make sustain some profit margin uh, by this randomization uh, uh, strategy. So of course, this assumes uh, you know, something about 
you know, how people search, do people have, are there a lot of searchers out there or are there, you know, are people are mainly non-shoppers? So to have a quantitative implication as to how high a margin you can charge, you have to know the distribution of search costs in the population. Okay. So to that, in the remaining five minutes, let me just say what's the sort of what we tried to do in this research. The first paper was about trying to get at how do people actually search online, as, at least. Because offline, we have very little information about this. And in some ways, we should probably team up with ethnographers more to actually ask people, what are you doing? Interview them, how do you search? You know, unfortunately, there's no data sets out there like this, at least for economists. Maybe marketers have more information. Um, so what we use is the Comscore data which is, uh, tracks people's browsing behavior. Um, so we see the set of URLs they look at, and we also see purchases. That's the thing that Comscore is good at capturing. They see whether you purchase an item. So what we do then is basically look at sort of how many bookstores do you go to before purchasing a book. And, uh, and what we find basically, you know, let me show you some of the main graphs of this. First of all, you know, Amazon is the behemoth here, sort of 65% of transactions go on Amazon. And in terms of visits too, they attract 80% of visits. So other bookstores basically you know, have nothing, uh, very little uh, in terms of you know, uh, traffic uh, c coming in. And um, most users, not surprisingly, do visit only one store, and that's Amazon. And what we find are very strong loyalty effects. You know, people tend to be very persistent in their um, searches. You know, sort of people who, who were shopping at Barnes & Noble before are much more likely to go to Barnes & Noble than to Amazon or some other site. Okay? Very few consumers search more than two stores um, if, uh, for a book. Okay? So this is, you know, basically the, the graph of this. So... <coughs> The other thing is sort of what we do is we basically test between different theories of search. But I think one thing that comes out from this is based on the distribution of search costs in the population, what we're able to come up with is, um, is, is indicators of, let's say, the pricing power that each bookstore has. So what's the pricing power? It depends on the responsiveness of people to prices, right? So if, if people are very price elastic, very price sensitive, then your ability to charge high prices above marginal costs are low. But we do this for different the stores and basically find, not surprising, that Amazon is able to charge much higher prices if it wanted to than Barnes & Noble, but the other book clubs. Okay? Let me end with this. This is sort of a newer project. So this was on the consumer side, trying to understand how people search and how sort of what the search costs that they face are. But our newer project is to look at how firms are actually setting prices in this industry. So for this, we're getting, continually getting hourly price feeds from the bookstores for a select group of titles. And let me just end with sort of a few sort of pictures that we got from this, which I think are really interesting. Let me just go sort of directly to these. So these are hourly book prices, what I'm plotting, across four stores, Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Walmart, and Books A Million. Okay. So this, that's all, for the same book. That's, that's all for the same book. And we get this information hourly. And for this book, for example, they're all the fixed price. But for this book, you have very different patterns. You have Barnes & Noble sort of having moving prices a lot, but Amazon seems to lag Barnes & Noble quite a bit. And, and Books A Million as well is tracking those prices. Interestingly, Walmart is setting always this you know, sort of high price and they don't change it regardless of what the other guys are doing. So the plot thickens a little bit more here, so here, some pretty crazy pricing patterns, sort of, again, Barnes & Noble is leading, so it's, they're doing some price increases, and Amazon is always tracking them, just you know, beating them by a little bit, and Books A Million matching them as well. 
Barnes and Noble, once in a while, that's interesting, tries these spikes. There are these very short-term spikes in prices that you, you will see. And um, so here's the drop, and maybe appropriate name. Here's Amazon does pretty crazy <laughs> high-low pricing strategies, etc. So you know, it's 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 basically, you know, what we're trying to figure out now is you know, is there something? <laughs> What can we rationalize as economists about these pricing strategies? It's a uh, yes, yeah. It, it's it's pretty. I mean, I think sort of, and a lot of this automated. They you know they have bots that are doing this, but you know, but it's clear that they are tracking each other's prices very carefully. And sort of Amazon, I think, as a general strategy, never wants to be. Uh, above Barnes and Noble. They always want to sort of send a signal we're below Barnes and Noble. But Walmart, regardless of everything, is you know has this very different pricing strategy of setting just a single price and sticking with it throughout these uh, time periods and again sort of I the shocking part whenever you go back to Amazon the mortgage prices and stuff are that's what it changed exactly. Exactly. So there, I mean that that's a puzzle that you know why are they sort of <laughs> setting this? Exactly. So thanks a lot for listening. <laughs>